has 34 member countries, two regional organizations, the World Bank and the IMF that assist it with respect to its uh, national risk assessments, and there are eight FATF style regional bodies of which CFATF is one. Among other things, their members have financial intelligence units, or FIUs, which are designed to receive, analyze, and disseminate key domestic information to uh, locally and internationally. And the really good FIUs are able to join an organization called the Egmont Group. Now that is as much of the boring definition that I'll give you tonight. FATF has three main priorities that you have to keep in mind. And this will be important in your total understanding of the way in which the organization functions and why, for instance, Guyana is where it is today. First of all, the main priorities are standards issued by way of recommendations. This, for instance, is the FATF document, FATF recommendations. The second is ensuring effective compliance. That's the second rule. And the third is the issuance of documents called uh, typologies, which are really scenarios. As it relates to the standards, uh, we who uh, are familiar with the plumbing of the international financial system uh, describe that as soft law. Essentially, the non-enforceable standards are guidelines. They can't be particularly enforced by any court of law in any national uh, country. But they can or they do have, um, well, I should put it this way, despite their, their, their lack of formal um, uh, legal binding powers, they can act in a very credible and authoritative manner within institutional framework for financial regulation. And it is the adherence to that form of soft law that gives FATF, and by extension, CFATF, uh, their legitimacy. The third priority, which is the typologies exercise, focuses on methods, the second, second sorry, um, focuses on trends and countermeasures, and also it, it allows the, uh, the FATF to communicate to its members what is new, essentially, what are the new dangers with respect to not only compliance, uh, but also the, 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 the entire uh, the entire financial architecture in the context of anti-money laundering. This, for instance, is, a, is, is an example of a typology document, which is a national money laundering and terrorist financing risk assessment document. Uh, to be more specific, it covers areas, for instance, how exactly uh, the contributors to the risk assessment interrelate. I'm rushing through this part because it's not the gravamen of what I'm going to say, but it's just really background material. It also covers areas related to some of which you may have heard as well, national risk assessments, national threat assessments, and so on. Those are all typology documents. The key, where I want, the, the key I want to focus on is the FATF methodology. This is the one that holds the most challenge for territories throughout the world, uh, more specifically Guyana. Because the final aspect of FATF's rule, the three that I mentioned, which is to ensure effective compliance, means that through this methodology document, FATF is able to communicate exactly how it will go about doing its assessments or mutual evaluations. First, there's usually an annual self-assessment using the risk assessment document that I just showed you, the typology document. And then there's a mutual evaluation exercise. So the CFATF and FATF do not just simply uh, wake up with a snap of fingers and say we're going to issue an adverse public statement against Guyana. There's a process, and it's important that the process be understood, even though I'm rushing it now, it's important that the process be understood as the backbone or the spine uh, from which action is taken and from which effective anti-money laundering regimes, which is the topic I'm dealing with tonight, uh, uh, can be built. The mutual evaluation report is a peer review, meaning that the other countries under the umbrella of the FATF or the World Bank or the IMF uh, come together and they have a team that would assess and evaluate the country and the extent to which it has implemented its anti-money laundering and, and terrorist financing regime 
and the extent to which it is in compliance with that regime. FATF essentially recognizes four levels of compliance, and this is also equally important. The first of which is you're compliant, so there are no shortcomings. Can you see that? Brilliant. You're largely compliant, there are only minor shortcomings. Partially compliant, there are moderate shortcomings. Non compliant, there are major shortcomings and not applicable. In almost every case, recently, Guyana has found itself somewhere between the non compliant or partially compliant. Though tonight, I'm not going to do a few things. I'm not going to go into any specifics of Guyana's legislation, nor of Guyana's MER, except to a very, very limited extent. I'm going to go into Guyana's MER only to illustrate to you now the importance of getting that MER right. And I'm going to use an example that I used when I spoke to the lawyers in November last year, the Bar Association. I, I mentioned to them that in Guyana's last MER done in, in Mutual Evaluation Report, MER done in, in uh, to, uh, 2011, uh, and this, this is a really funny diversion, the assessors could not quite make up their minds how many lawyers we had in Guyana. And I give them the example, if you notice here, we start there, all lawyers admitted to the Guyana Bar is eligible for membership in the association. At the time of the annual evaluation, this is 2011, there are about, can you see that? 30, 30 active subscriber members, three zero. And then we go here as well. According to the Guyana Bar Association, there are approximately 300 practicing lawyers in the country who operate on the Legal Practitioners Act. And then it goes on and it says 30 again. The point I'm trying to make is that if you get this wrong, there may be a significant impact in the way in which lawyers in Guyana are risk rated for the purposes of design of the AML CFT framework and the extent to which your compliance is expected. The truth is that at the time that that evaluation was being done, Guyana had in excess of a thousand lawyers. And that includes, unfortunately, persons who have left the country or reside outside the country like myself and those who are unfortunately deceased. But the point is made, between 30 and 300, it's massively off target. At best 700, off target. And that's huge. So it's important that as a country, as an organization, as a lobby group, when the time comes for Guyana's next risk assessment, that the information given there is accurate, or at least we do our best to ensure that the assessors uh, have access to accurate information. Because if if someone is reading this MER and thinking, oh, this is a country with only 30 lawyers, what is the worry, I mean, or 300 lawyers? I mean, but that, that is just a diversion that, uh, that sort of, to make the point. So when you consider where Guyana is, and I'm not knocking CFATF or any of the assessors for this, I'm just saying it could have been an honest mistake in terms of the recording, but either way, it was completely inaccurate in terms of what the true risk to Guyana's, uh, uh, you know, legal fraternity or legal sector uh, pose in terms of the, the sheer quantum of, of possible transactions being done. Why I came back to this document is because from this year, FATF is employing new methodology. In fact, this document is the new methodology that FATF is complying. It is, in, is, is uh, uh, sorry, um, has launched already. Those assessors are going to use this document, the 2013 methodology, to do future risk assessments. Guyana's assessment is not due for a couple of years. Trinidad will be done next year. I think Trinidad will be the first country in the Caribbean to be, to be assessed. And then Guyana will be done later, in a few years' time. Maybe latest by 2020, I imagine. But the point is that the new methodology uh, is going to put Guyana in a relatively difficult position. Because at the moment, we haven't complied under the old methodology. This new methodology emphasizes not just technical compliance, but it also imposes an effectiveness assessment, which twins very nicely with the topic I'm going to deal with, I'm dealing with tonight, which is effective anti money laundering regimes. And the important thing to understand is that FATF has its own definition of effectiveness, and it's the extent to which certain defined outcomes are achieved. 
and the extent to which the system is able to mitigate those outcomes. This essentially is a template. I can take you through it rather quickly. There is, as you can see, one high level objective. That the financial system and the broader economy are protected from threats to money laundering, threats of money laundering, sorry, and the finance of terrorism and proliferation, thereby strengthening financial sector integrity and contributing to safety and security. Now here's where you get to join the fund. Because as I go through the intermediate and the immediate outcomes, I want you to conceptualize in your own mind whether you think by in the next two years or the next four years, whenever um, Guyana's assessment is due, Guyana will be able to meet that level of effectiveness. They word it very, very simply, so each of you can follow. Um, so here we go. We see the intermediate objectives, policy coordination and cooperation, pushes of crimes and funds are, uh, are detected and reported, and when non trucks are detected and disrupted, same for terrorist financing threats. You can see it there. The key, however, test of effectiveness is whether these 11 intermediate, immediate objectives are met. The first is risks. Terrorist financing and money laundering risks are understood. How many of you don't, don't show your hands? Can, uh, can say honestly, hand on heart, that you understand risks even in the context of your own business, whether you are a lawyer, whether you're a businessman, whatever you do. Um, but think about it in that way. Personalize each one as I go through them. I'll go through them rather quickly, but, but think about them in the context of whether you believe that you will be able to meet this, uh, the, 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 these effectiveness measurements in two years' time, four years' time, six years' time, whatever. The first is that you understand risks and actions are coordinated, not used specifically, but within the country, risks, risks are understood and act actions are coordinated to combat money laundering, terrorist finance, and proliferation. The second is an obligation on the country that through international cooperation, we're able to deliver and receive appropriate information, financial intelligence and evidence, uh, which facilitates action, 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 action against criminals and their assets. I said the word action a few times because I'm actually going to end my talk on that word, so bear that in mind. The third is that supervisors appropriately supervise, monitor, and regulate financial institutions and DNFBPs, that's designated non-financial business and persons, for compliance with the MLCFT requirements, commits with their risks. So if there's any supervisor in the room, uh, have a crack at that. The third is that the fourth sorry is that these financial institutions of the NFBPs adequately apply preventive measures, MLCFT preventive measures, commensurate with their risks, and report suspicious transactions. The fifth, that legal persons and arrangements are prevented from misuse of the financial system, misuse of uh, terrorist, of non terrorist financing and information on their beneficial ownership is available to competent authorities without impediment. The sixth, financial intelligence is being used by competent authorities for investigations. The sixth is that money laundering offenses are investigated and offenses are prosecuted. I'll come back to this as well, because there's a heavy debate about this. And I believe that sometimes this one is, is too strictly construed, because if we're going to be assessed on the basis of having prosecutions, of having had successful prosecutions, uh, and, and proportionate and persuasive sanctions, then we may have a problem. Because there's some countries where there's really no need for a prosecution for you to have an effective anti-money laundering system. Whereas in some of the countries, that is an essential element. And if we were to really rank countries according to their, you know, the extent to which they, 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 they prosecute, uh, some of the better countries, the Swedens and the Switzerlands and so on, would not do very well. And you know, the, the Mexicos and so on would, would in turn do, do very well. Uh, the eighth is the proceeds and instrumentals of crime are confiscated. Think about Ghana being able to achieve that. To, to ensure effectiveness. The ninth is the terrorist financial activities are investigated. This prosecution, in effect, this portion this, this and dissuasive sanctions. Ten, which is similar to eight, terrorist organizations and, and finances are prevented from raising, moving, and using funds and abusing the NPO sector. Eleven, persons and entities involved in the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction are prevented from raising, moving, and using funds consistent with the relevant UN Security Council resolutions. So while we think about that, and I'm going over those briefly, but while we think about that, we can now, and each one is represented here. I, I pulled this up because I want you to have a specific look at what the thing looks like. This is the real deal. This is not just me spewing words off of a piece of paper. This is the real deal. 
each of these effectiveness assessments tells you exactly what are the characteristics of an effective system. So if you go through that new methodology, you can see for yourself, even if you're relatively unsophisticated in the language of, money, of anti money laundering, what it is going to take and why there is, you could possibly take the view that Guyana uh, will be challenged. I should stop saying Guyana, say we will be challenged uh, to climb that hill. Now, there are several points to note about the direction in which FATF is, is going with respect to assessing effectiveness. The first of, of which I mentioned. The second is that there is the existence of certain structural elements. And by the way, when those 11 immediate outcomes are, are assessed, there's an effectiveness rating assigned that goes from high level of effectiveness to low level of effectiveness. See, there's high level, substantial level, moderate level, and low level which essentially mirrors the compliance assessments. So under the new methodology, there's an emphasis both on compliance, which is what Guyana is working towards now, and effectiveness. So there's now a serious twin obligation. There always has been, but it's no more defined. A serious twin obligation with respect to anti-money laundering. Why would I put up a map of Africa? Because the new methodology makes it clear that there will be certain uh, there will be the need for effective regimes to be assessed on the basis of the existence of certain structural elements being in place. For example, political stability, a high level of commitment to address AML-CFT issues, stable institutions with accountability and integrity and transparency, the rule of law, and a capable, independent, and efficient judicial system, the absence of which may, in fact, um, affect effective, uh, effectiveness. There's also the question of maturity of the supervisory regime, the level of corruption, and the impact of measures to combat corruption. You'll hear more on this later, and I'll try to, uh, to ensure that I keep it in context, because I, I have no uh, political implications, and I, I came in the room without, political, without, political, uh, 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 without any political implications uh, in terms of what, I, what, I, what, what I'm about to say, and I tend to leave the room that way as well. I, I, I intend to ensure that as far as possible, all sides of the, of the coin are, uh, are dealt with today. So why the map of Africa? Because in the context of the need for a political will and a high level of political commitment to the process, technical capacity, I ask, uh, particularly in light of some of what has been said in Guyana, and what has been said elsewhere about Guyana, the need for us to understand that effective AML safety systems can be bespoke, can be tailored, can be unique. And FATF is ensuring that on a new methodology, their, their assessors understand that there are several different ways to achieve an effective AML safety system, and that the assessor's own preferred model may not be appropriate in the context of the country being assessed. The reason why I say that is because in the context of Guyana, we have, within the depths of this current crisis, an opportunity to craft an AML CFT regime that is entirely suitable to our needs, but that is exactly compliant and also, moreover, effective. And I would like to use the example, not of the whole of Africa, but of this country right here, Malawi. I could choose any other country, but I chose Malawi for a reason. It's a landlocked country, as you can see there. The biggest crime in Malawi, or the biggest issue that they have, is the trade of cannabis sativa, or Indian hemp. It, there's a porous cross border, and it's considered like a transshipment point for narcotics trafficking. It is among the world's least developed and densely populated countries. I think it has about uh, less than half the size of Guyana uh, and probably about 25 times our population. But let's take a look at, oh sorry, the economy is also heavily dependent on agriculture. But let's take a look at what Malawi has. Malawi has a, I'll just jump to the other, to the other slide. 
This is Malawi's mutual evaluation report, and I'll take you through just a few aspects of it. Malawi has a national EML CFT committee, a national counterterrorism committee. This is something that CFETF has been trying to have implemented in all of its territories, and recently been applauded by FETF for trying to do that. The FIU was established in 2007. It has its own budget provided by the government via the Ministry of Finance. The FIU, like Guyana's FIU, is administrative. That means it has no investigative or prosecutorial powers. It recruits its own, staff, its own staff. Its independence and autonomy are guaranteed by statute. And its operations, here it is, are fully computerized. Bravo, Malawi. It also became the eighth country out of 153 in Africa to gain admission to the Eggman Group. Remember that organization I mentioned to you earlier where uh, the best FIUs in the world are able to apply and enter the Eggman Group? So what's so important or unique about Malawi that's relevant to our current circumstances? Well, it's simply that uh, Malawi has the director of Malawi's FIU, and I'm going to just try to pull the, the, the exact quote here. The, the, the director of Malawi's FIU is appointed by the president but his appointment has to be confirmed by a public appointments committee, which is a committee comprised of members of parliament. I'm not saying that to endorse any view of any specific uh, political party or interest or any type of advocacy in Guyana, but I'm using this as a strong example to illustrate to you why you can have a bespoke but compliant a bespoke but also compliant MLCFT, effective MLCFT regime. I think maybe it's two slides down. This is the forfeiture. Malawi, Malawi also had a problem with use of the word forfeiture, I should say. Because it had been abused by previous governments, here it is. They, they essentially outlawed the use of the word forfeiture in their MLCFT legislation. And I say that because they were discomforted by it, they chose instead to use the word confiscation. And that in itself is a major variation with respect to FETF. Because for standardization, which FETF prefers to have, everyone uses forfeiture. But Malawi decided we're comfortable with this word for, from years of abuse by our government, our governments, and we'd rather use the word uh, confiscation. So there it is. The president of the, F, the head of the FAU, sorry, can only be removed due to incapacity or incompetence. There's no risk of political influence in his removal. And his appointment is made by a parliamentary committee. It's made by the president, sorry, but it's confirmed by a parliamentary committee to which reports are also made. His term is of five years, as I mentioned earlier. But here is something that's pretty important. In 2008, when this MER was done, who can guess what was the position in Malawi's parliament? Nobody? Uh, I know you couldn't do it. The opposition controlled Malawi's parliament in 2008. At the time that they were taking steps. That is why it struck me as having so many similarities to Guyana. And it gave me hope as well that if we look far enough and deep enough, we can find sufficient examples as a country. And I say we because I claim ownership uh, of part of the process as well. And I'll tell you why later in my conclusion. I believe that we all have a responsibility to speak, speak ethically to the issue of how we go about designing our effective anti money laundering regime. No single person or entity, uh, a party or a corporation owns the right for us to design, uh, uh, the right to, 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 to simply dictate how we design our MLCFT regime. What is important is that it must be compliant with, with, with FETF recommendations and it must also be uh, effective. And to ensure that you don't take my word for it, I think it was probably on the first slide where, uh, where it said that. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is that the opportunity to have a bespoke AML CFT regime is essentially within our powers. It's right there. Can you see that? The first line. There are other elements or pillars that I call them uh, of effective anti money laundering regimes that I'm just going to touch on briefly. Um, one is, as I mentioned earlier regarding significance, 
that it is important that the foundation be the same, but there be an opportunity for variations. That doesn't mean that you go put anything into law. It's just that there is an opportunity for variations that the assessors will respect. And not is that you can have a bespoke mechanism for compliance. Remember I mentioned effectiveness and compliance. On the compliance side, you can do what I call gold plating, or essentially super compliance. I mentioned this at the time I spoke to the lawyers, where you can go 